reading is from Mark, chapter 16, verses 1 to 8. The Resurrection. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, who will roll away the stone from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. And as they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Hallelujah. Let's pray. A short verse to focus our prayers. From John chapter 1, verse 5, it says, The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Jesus, today, amongst all days, we recognize and worship you as God. You are the author of all creation. You are the Lord of all, King of kings, our risen Savior, and the light of the world. At the beginning of all creation, the words were spoken, let there be light. And it was through you and for you that the world and everything in it came into being. You are the beginning. For hundreds of years, history pointed to the moment that you would give up heaven and step down into the darkness that we had invited in so that you could light it up. And as you finished the greatest rescue mission of all time, Jesus, light of the world, you went to the cross for us. Darkness covered the land and heaven looked away as you took the punishment for our mess, our mistakes, our sin. But the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. On the third day you rose from the grave, you carried the darkness, carried our darkness to the cross and you overcame it. Thank you, Jesus, you are our risen savior. You overcame the darkness for each of us personally and with the power that it's for all of us. And we pray for ourselves that you would help us to be childlike. Not childish, but childlike. And in that respect this morning, I mean afraid of the dark. The darkness that so often we're not as afraid of as we should be. An old poem says, I st said to the man who stood at the gate of the year, give me a light that I might tread safely into the unknown. And he replied, go out into the darkness and put your hand into the hand of God. That shall be better you better to you than light and safer than a known way. Jesus, I thank you for your invitation to walk with us as we continue on in a place that is not yet eradicated of darkness. We gladly accept your invitation this morning. Your word, your presence with us is a lamp for our feet and a light for our path. When we feel as though we're surrounded and overcome with darkness, we take heart because you have overcome the world. And Jesus, light of the world, we look forward to the day that you will return in your radiant glory. It will be magnificent, awesome, and eternal. You are the beginning, and you are also the end. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Amen. As Doug is going to come up and speak to us now, I'd just like to pray for Doug. Lord Jesus, thank you for Doug. Thank you for all the hard work that he's put into preparing this sermon for us today. We pray that we will all be thoroughly blessed by it and learn more about your word. And we pray that the Holy Spirit will speak through Doug now as he brings your word, Lord. Amen. Good morning, 
everybody. And to those on live stream, morning to you as well. Happy Easter to you all. Can I um, ask for your prayers this morning? This week I've been battling with vertigo, or labyrinthitis as the posh people call it. Uh, and it's left me a bit wobbly on my feet, so uh, I've got to be careful how I move my head this morning. So I'd value your prayers, because I don't want you to go on and say, he was drunk this morning, he was wobbling all over the place, staggering all around. So I don't know how he was celebrating Easter. But uh, I'd value your prayers for that. Why don't you just greet each other with a happy Easter. Good morning to you. Lovely to see you. Welcome. Good. We're all settled down. I'm sorry you haven't got your Easter eggs, but... the. The children here have, the young people have got their Easter eggs. Did you get any Easter eggs, guys? You got some, good, okay. So I know where to come if I want an Easter egg this morning. Okay, there was a, a lady who was on a very strict diet. No sugar, no milk, that sort of stuff. <coughs> and uh, she, was, she was struggling with this diet. And one day she was um, passing a cafe. So she went in, because she was feeling a bit down, thought, I'll have a cup of coffee. <coughs> so she went in. <coughs> Excuse me, and she asked for a cup of black coffee, sugarless, very strong. And she got her coffee and she went and she sat down at a table and she was feeling quite miserable and battling with this uh, strict diet of hers. And then a man came and sat at the table and he had two <laughs> very sugary jam donuts and a cup of coffee. And he sat opposite her and she just looked at him. He picked up one of the jam donuts, stuck it in his north and south, took a big bite, and of course all the sugar went round his mouth and the jam oozed out onto the table, and she was in total mental agony. <laughs> and he sort of looked at her and smiled and carried on eating until he'd consumed the whole lot, and she was in absolute mental agony. And then he got up, picked up his phone, and left. But he left one donut on the table. And she sat there looking at it. And it spoke to her. It said, eat me, eat me, eat me, forget your diet, eat me. And she battled with the temptation. And in the end, she could stand it no longer. She reached out, she grabbed hold of it, stuffed it in her mouth, north and south, took a huge bite, and all the bliss, all the pleasure, all the delight as the jam oozed out and the sugar went on her lips. She's licking her lips, closing her eyes in pleasure and delight. Then she opened her eyes and saw the man return to the table with a second <laughs> cup of coffee. <laughs> that was an unexpected resurrection. She thought he was gone. She thought he was gone for good. But he came back. He came back. An unexpected <laughs> resurrection. And, and that's a, a bit similar, I guess, to the experience of the women that Mark records in his gospel in chapter 16. The other three gospels tell us about the uh, resurrection of Jesus and they give us additional details to it. But Mark's version is very succinct and it matches up to the style of his gospel because his is the shortest gospel, the liveliest gospel, the earliest gospel. It's the first gospel that was written. And so, th so the succinctness of chapter 16 and the first eight verses matches the style because in um, the, the more modern versions, it, the, the key word in Mark is immediately. If you use the King James Version, the word is straightway. And that, verse, that word appears something like 19 times through Mark's gospel. It's a gospel of action and movement because it's written for the Romans, basically. So Mark tells us that, uh, or this, this is an interesting quote from the uh, Anglican theologian R.T. France, who was also the uh, uh, principal of Wycliffe College, the big Anglican evangelical college. And he said this, none of them 
according to the Gospels, none of them includes an account of the actual rising of Jesus from death. And all assume, that's the Gospels, that this has taken place at some time prior to the discovery of the empty tomb. So we won't find in the Gospels any uh, description or account of the rising of Jesus. We just have the fact of the empty tomb and the fact that he is risen. Now the ladies, the Sabbath is over, Mark tells us, and Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome, uh, they are heading towards the tomb. They're setting out early in the morning. The thing that fascinated me was these are the three same women that were, were the last at the cross. Mark tells us in chapter 15, they were the ones who were the last at the cross, and they're the first at the tomb. Women, first at the tomb, last at the cross. God honors women. And then the other thing is this that, that occurred to me as I was reading this. I don't know if you've ever noticed the significance of Mary and Joseph at the birth of Jesus and at the death of Jesus or the resurrection of Jesus. See, Mary and Joseph, Mary the, Mary, the mother of Jesus and Joseph, her betrothed, were there at the beginning when Jesus was born. Now, Joseph of Arimathea and two Marys are there at the tomb. From the womb to the tomb, Jesus has Mary and Joseph looking after him. I don't know what that means, but it was significant to me. It sort of helped me a little bit. They come bringing additional spices because there's no embalming in the Jewish experience. So they want to make a pleasant smell <clears throat> on a decomposing body. So they bring additional spices to anoint the body of Jesus. And the one big problem that they have, as Mark tells us, <clears throat> is they're asking who's going to move the stone. Uh, Mark 15 tells us that it was a, or 16 tells us it was a large stone. It was a stone put there by Joseph because this was Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. And he put, rolled a load, large stone in front of the tomb. And it must have been heavy. So they're saying, who's going to help us move? The soldiers won't help us move it. Who's going to help us move the stone? And they come to the tomb, and the soldiers are not there, of course, because the soldiers, Matthew tells us, have been troubled by an earthquake, and they, they have, uh, have been troubled by the appearance of an angel of the Lord, who's terrified them, and they've left, and they've gone. So when the women arrive, the entrance to the tomb is open. The stone has been rolled away. Not to let Jesus out, but to let the women and the disciples in. And uh, the body has been taken, they say. Who's taken the body? John records that for us. They were puzzled. He's gone. Where's he gone? Who's taken it? And uh, then suddenly they meet an angel and their puzzlement is termed to alarm because uh, the word alarmed that's translated here in, in Mark's gospel means deeply distressed and troubled or overwhelmed with wonder and you can you can you know that's not surprising is it that the women would be overwhelmed and surprised but then the angel says to them look He's not here. You're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. He's not here. He's risen. So immediately the women know they're at the right tomb. They haven't come to the wrong tomb. They've come to the right tomb. And, and the angel, they see, because the angel says, look, this is where he lay. They see the grave clothes that are there, and a neatly folded face cloth is there as well. And he's gone. Where's he gone? And then the angel gives them the good news. He is risen. Nobody has stolen the body. No grave robbers have come along and half inch the body. He's risen. He's risen. And uh, that's the first gospel message, isn't it? Really, if you think about it. Good news. He's risen. He's risen. He's not here. He's gone. And the resurrection is an important part, a significant part, a vital part of our gospel declaration. 
telling people the good news. If Jesus had just died on the cross, that wouldn't be good news. That would be sad news. But he's risen. That's the good news. That's the good news. Now, that's uh, Eastbourne College. I went there once for a week. I'm not that clever. And, and I went there once for a week. It was the, it was the um, National Young Life campaign. This was 1956, about 100 years ago. Uh, about 1956, August 1956, the last week in August 1956, I'd been invited by my friends, a couple of friends at Lloyd's, the underwriting room where I worked, to go on holiday with them to the National Young Life Campaign Christian Holiday Center week at Eastbourne College. The bit they left out from me was the Christian bit. They just said it was a holiday with plenty of girls and plenty of fun. We want you to come. And that appealed to me. And I went. And uh, during the week, I was encountered the fact of Jesus. And it was, um, it was a blow to my system because I'd never really encountered the fact of Jesus before in the lives of people that were there, young people that were there. And they kept pestering me to go to the meetings, and I went to the last meeting of the whole week. The Reverend Jeffrey King, a Baptist minister, was preaching. He was preaching from Romans 1, verse 16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. He preached the gospel. He told us that we're made in the image and likeness of God, but sin had marred and spoiled us, separated us from God, and we needed to be saved. We needed to be forgiven and brought back into a relationship with God because that was what we were destined for. That was what we were created for. That was all new to me, but what wasn't new to me was the fact of sin. I knew was, I was a sinner. I knew that my life was wrong sexually, immorally. It was wrong because I stole. It was wrong because I was a liar. It was wrong because I got into fights and scrapes and I, and I had a, a bad temper. I knew that my life was wrong. I knew it wasn't right. And then I sat there thinking, well, look, you've told me that Jesus has died to deal with my sin, but how does somebody who died 2,000 years ago affect me today in 1956? But you see, he didn't stop preaching there. He preached the resurrection. Jesus is alive. And I suddenly realized, I know now it was the Holy Spirit, illuminating my mind and telling me, look, Doug, what happened 2,000 years ago is effective because the dead Jesus is the risen Jesus. He's the living Jesus. And he wants to come and live in your life. And I surrendered my life to Jesus that night. And for the last 60 odd years, he's been changing my life and making me the person he wants me to be. There's a long way to go, as you know, but there's a long way to go in my life. And that was the good news. And the, the angel said, look, go and tell his disciples and go and tell Peter because this is a global message. This has got to go out to the world. And the disciples, you need to take it out to the world. And um, it, it's important because it needs to be shared universally. But go and tell the disciples and Peter. Because Peter is the leader of the disciples at that particular time. And I want, Peter needs to be reassured that his uh, restoration to Jesus is true, is real. So go and reassure Peter. And the fact that Peter's mentioned is, is important in a sense because Peter is the main supplier of information to Mark. He's the main uh, witness in Mark's gospel, giving him Mark the information that he needs about Jesus. And the women leave trembling. They leave trembling. And, and it's interesting, and they, they come and puzzled, but they leave trembling. And the idea of the word is physically shaken caused by a great fear. And it says they are afraid, but they're not afraid of being harmed by the angel. They're afraid in a sense of bewilderment at the encounter with the supernatural. Now, I guess most of us would be shaken if we met an angel. Most of us would be afraid in that sense of bewilderment if we met somebody from heaven you see, it's interesting, isn't it? Whenever in the Bible, whenever people, human beings like us, meet angelic beings, the first thing that angels say to them is, fear not. Don't be afraid. Because there's something, you know, overwhelming when we encounter the supernatural. 
And so the women leave and they go and they tell Peter and John and Peter and John come to the tomb and you probably know the rest of the story as well as I do. The resurrection. This morning we celebrate Jesus is alive. Okay, so what does that mean for us? Well, for me, it means a number of things and I'll share them with you. The first thing it means for me is that the resurrection is foundational to the Christian faith. Foundations are vital, aren't they? If the foundations on our house are destroyed, the house collapses. And we've been reading recently about the terrible accident at Baltimore Bridge in America when the bridge was hit by a container ship and the bridge collapsed just a few days ago. And sadly, a number of workmen on the bridge repairing the road died. It was a tragedy because the sh container ship hit the stanchions, like the foundation of the bridge, and sent it into collapse. Foundations are vital. If you removed the bottom brick of that Lego tower, the whole thing would collapse because the foundations have been removed. The foundation of our Christian faith is significant and important because it's the foundation of the resurrection. And the resurrection is mentioned 108 times in 260 verses of the New Testament. It's the fulcrum of theology. It's not a fable, it's a fact. It's not a fantasy or a myth, it's reality. It's not reincarnation, it's not revival, it's not recovery, it's resurrection into a new life existence. Because when we, are res when we, are, when we die and enter into the presence of Jesus, we'll have the same resurrection body like Jesus. We have a new existence, a new bodily existence, a resurrection body. And the resurrection is the foundation of our faith. It's not a beautiful story with a romantic moral ending. It's a historical event whose credibility is vital to the credibility of the gospel. It's God's written historical receipt on the validity of the death of Jesus Christ on the cross because it takes place in time and geography and history. And God is saying to us through the resurrection, look, this says that what Jesus has done on the cross is acceptable to me. There is forgiveness, there is new life for everyone who trusts in the work of Christ. And the resurrection explains the gospels, not vice versa. It's, the, it's related, of course, with the, with the death of Jesus, but it's, a, it's the heart of the gospel. And it's not simply a component of the gospel, it's a centerpiece of the gospel. Without the resurrection, there is no salvation. No salvation. You see, how central and important the resurrection is. It's important to our gospel presentation. It's important to our Christian experience that Jesus lives in us by his spirit to enable us to be the person he wants us to be day by day. And the second thing is this. There are, it seems to me, fatal consequences if we don't believe about the resurrection. Now, I read an interesting story this week about Lieutenant David Steves. That's a picture of him. Now, he was a pilot in the American Air Force. And in May 1957, he flew his Lockheed trainer jet over the Sierra Nevada mountains. Something happened in the cockpit. There was a, an explosion in the cockpit. He parachuted out and the plane crashed and he landed in the snowy Sierra Nevada mountains. There was a search made for him when he didn't report in and they couldn't find him and they couldn't find the plane. And so they wrote him off after a number of searches looking for him and the plane. They wrote him off and said he was dead. So he was signed off as being dead. And then 54 days later, he walked out of the wilderness alive. And he told a fantastic survival story of how after the plane had crashed, he'd survived in the mountains 
and walked out with an injured leg, burns, but he survived in the snow of the mountains. And he was, you know, everybody thought he was great, wonderful, great story. And so they searched again to find the plane where he tried to describe where he went down. They couldn't find the plane. And so they decided that it was a hoax. Some people even suggested that he'd sold the plane to the Russians for $100,000 or something like that. And there was all kinds of wrong things said about him. They didn't believe him. And because they didn't believe him, he was made to leave the Air Force. He had to resign because of all the pressures from the press and these wonderful stories going around about him. His marriage broke up and he got divorced. And in 1967, he died. He died. And then, in 1977, 20 years later, a group of scouts in the Sierra Mountains found the wreckage of his plane. And his story was true. But unfortunately, it was 10 years too late for him because he died too early. And that was the report in the wreckage clears the survivor's name. It didn't heal his marriage because he'd been divorced. His wife had moved away, his family had moved away. And he never lived long enough to know that what he said was true was finally vindicated. You see, there were consequences for him because his story was not believed. It's interesting that that's the very thing that Paul takes up in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Because Paul takes up the fact of saying to the Corinthians, of course there are certain arguments going on amongst the Corinthians that say Jesus didn't rise from the dead, the resurrection is not true. And so Paul writes to them to say, basically, if Christ be not risen, those are the wrong verses there, that's the earlier verses. It comes later what I'm talking about, verse 12 onwards. And he, he, what Paul uses is this argument, reductio ad absurdum. Thank you, Rob. And, and what that means is this. Proving something is false by showing its logical consequence is absurd or contradictory. So Paul starts by saying, if Christ be not risen, these are the consequences which are absurd. Which are absurd. And, and these, this is what Paul is saying. And it's important for us to, to think this through. If Christ be not risen, Christ has died in vain. There is no forgiveness of sin. We are still in our sins. We are still condemned by our sin. Our preaching, my time here this morning preaching to you, has absolutely no substance at all. It's a complete waste of time. You may have thought that already, but it's a complete waste of time. Every time Rob and others stand on this platform and preach, a complete waste of time. Complete waste of time. The eyewitnesses that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 5, or thereabouts, the 500 who saw Jesus at any one time, and Paul says, and I, I saw him as well. So the apostles and Peter and Paul are liars. Nothing they say can be trustworthy if Christ be not risen from the dead. If Christ be not risen from the dead, we've wasted the last couple of hours here this morning. We really have. We might just as well have all gone across the road to Costa and had a, you know, um, a hot, uh, what a, a skinny mocha, uh, a latte, decaf latte, a large donut, yeah, <laughs> large donut. And, and you know, if, if, if this is not true, if, if what I'm saying is not true, if the resurrection didn't happen, then we're wasting our time. We might all just shift across the road and, and have a, a costa. If Christ be not risen from the dead. My testimony that I shared with you earlier in the service is a figment of my imagination. Jesus didn't transform my life from the person I told you I was and still battle with at times. Every missionary has invested their lives in nonsense. Catherine Porter, Ronnie Bassus, Innocent, Felix, waste of time. Waste of time, guys. You could have invested your life in something more. Jim Elliott and his friends who were martyred on the Ecuadorian River, they gave their lives uselessly. 
if Christ be not risen. The Bible is a, is a waste of paper, a waste of money, if Christ be not risen. And death is the ultimate victor. I rot in the grave when I die, just like an animal. Death is the ultimate victor. You see how fatal the consequences are if Christ be not risen. We are, of all people, most hopeless. Most hopeless. But, but, that's not the news, is it? That's not the news. Christ has been raised from the dead. Sisters and brothers, we, we enter into a new form of existence when we die. We pass into the presence of Jesus. We will see him. We will be like him. We will dwell in his presence forever. Our loved ones who have gone before us, we will meet them. We will greet them. We will see them. We will be, be reunited with our loved ones. That's the hope we have. My sins are forgiven. All those things that I told you about, they've been forgiven. They've been buried in the depths of the sea to be remembered no more. I'm a new person in Jesus. And... and in closing, I, I'm not going to show you any more PowerPoint, but in closing, look. The resurrection means you and I are forgiven. Whatever your past, when you put your trust in Christ, when you put your confidence in him, when you receive him as your Lord and Savior, he deals with the past. It doesn't have to haunt you anymore. It doesn't have to, you know, track your life. You don't have to pull the past around like a big iron chain on, and a ball on your ankles. It smashed it. Jesus took the hammer of the cross and smashed my past. So I'm free. I'm free. And not only is there forgiveness, but I have a friend in the glory. I have a friend there. And you and I, we, we sometimes look at the world in which we live. We might stand out on, 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 on the, um, the cliffs there at High Cliff. We might look out across the sea. We might be struggling and troubled and we might think, who's in charge of this universe? We might shout out into the universe, who goes there, friend or foe? And because of the resurrection, in the quietness of our heart, we will hear, friend, friend, friend. God will resonate because of the resurrection. He tells us he's our friend. And not only that, but we have in Jesus, because of the resurrection, we have a great high priest who ever lives to make intercession for us he continues his ministry in heaven for you and for me interceding for us jesus is praying for me and praying for you that's his ongoing ministry whatever your struggle this morning he knows he prays for you by name your name is written on the palms of his hands before the father he raises his hands in prayer and he prays for us he presents those nail-pierced hands and say, Father, this is my child. I'm praying for them. And his prayers are always answered and his prayers are always in the will of God. They're never hindered by sin. He never ceases to pray. He never forgets to pray. He never gets fed up with praying for you and for me. He's our great high priest. Whatever you're struggling with this morning, whatever doubts, whatever pressures at home or work or family or marriage or children, he's got your case. He's got you in his hand and he's praying for you. What a resurrection. What a friend we have in Jesus. Is he your friend? Is he your savior? Is he your Lord? I trust he is. Let's pray. In the quietness, why don't you make your response to Jesus? If you've never trusted him or not sure that you have, then trust him. Say, Jesus, I need you as my saviour, my forgiver, my friend, my Lord. Come and take your rightful place in my life this morning. And if you're under pressure in any way at all, lay that before him. Leave it with him because he loves you and cares about you and he's praying for you. Father, we thank you for this morning and the fact of the resurrection. 
and the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.